Well, good morning. Welcome to Connection Christian Church. I'm Aaron Jackson. I'm one of the pastors. We're so glad that you're here today joining in person. It's great seeing you. If you're watching online, we are so glad that you've joined us today and worshiping alongside together as we worship the one true God. If uh, someone were to ask you, what is Connection about? Would you have an answer for them? Like, what do we do? That's, that's right. I heard some good stuff out there. I'll, I'll put it for you. There's, there's nine words. To connect people to God and each other through Jesus. And if that's too complicated, I got three words for you. Make, mentor, mobilize. That is what we are about. We're about making disciples. We're about mentoring them and mobilizing them in their church, in our community, and in the world. So we have a lot going on. I just want to let you know right now, Mother's Day is in one week. So you all have been warned if there's any dads and need to take care of the mother of their children. Now you don't have an excuse. Amazon can get you an item in two days, so you can go on there and get ordered. So you don't have an excuse now. Next week is Mother's Day. And be thinking about your family and invite them here so we can celebrate them next week here at Connection. Uh, we got a couple things coming up. We have a ladies Bible study that starts on Tuesday. When's Tuesday? It's in two days from right now. So if you have not signed up for that, you should. They're gonna have a wonderful time growing together and learning how to read the Bible and study the Bible. So you are going to want to make sure you're part of that. You can sign up at the guest services table after service. We also really care about families and next gen and, and young families. So I know that if you have kids, I have a lot of little kids going around the house. And it's really hard sometimes to find time for dates. So Connection wants to help you and support you. So we have a date night schedule for Saturday night where you can just bring your kid up here. Bring your kids, sign up by Wednesday, and you can bring your children up here. And we have a no strings attached, free child care available. We're going to feed them going to watch a movie and give an opportunity for you to go out on a date and get to know your spouse again, know your spouse again, your partner again. In the same way we've been talking about this for our complicated relationship, you can use that RAM model with your family, with your spouse, and you can learn about each other again, trust, rely, and commit. All that stuff will go really well together. So we want to make sure you do that. I want to invite everyone to stand up right now for our call to worship. This comes from the book of First Chronicles, and have this verse this morning be your anthem, be your prayer. So whether you need to close your eyes, raise your hands, this scripture was getting us ready to worship and to put God first in our lives. So we're going to read this. This says, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and we praise your glorious name. There we go. My shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my dream. Till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. It was my truth till I met Cause when you called my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious name. You called. Now your freedom is 
This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. This is how. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm Again. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. And this is how I fight my battles. This is.
is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. Renew me, restore. Lord, we're so thankful this morning for your presence. And we come and we worship you confidently. We worship you because we remember your promises. We worship you because we remember no matter what we came in here with this morning that you are greater than that thing. God, we want to rest on you this morning. We want to be wrapped up in your arms and we want to be filled with your presence, with your spirit, with your word that uh, Brian's about to bring. We ask that it speak truth into our hearts, that it reveal things to us, that it call us to be closer to you. Again, Lord, we don't deserve any of this. And we just love you, and we're so thankful. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated?
I just love being here with you all. Uh, there's, God's just clearly doing some amazing things in this church family, and I'm privileged to be part of it with you all. I want to invite you to go ahead and take your Bible. If you want to preload it, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2 today, so you can start looking at that. Those of you who are joining online, welcome, and uh, invite you to go ahead and take a Bible as well. And I hope that something that we talk about today is a blessing to all of you. So last year, did you see the new show that came out on Netflix, Love is Blind? I think with the great quarantine of 2020, a lot more people saw it than normally would have. The premise, it's a reality show. It's very simple. It was just taking a whole bunch of strangers, putting them in a house together, and the people went on dates, blind dates, literally. They were in separate rooms. They didn't see each other for months. They would meet through uh, some sort of a communication, but they never saw each other face-to-face, -face, didn't know what each other looked like. After several uh, inter interactions like that, they had to make a decision as to whether they would get engaged and then, only then, once they decided to become engaged, would they get to see each other where they'd have one month of dating in person before they would go to a wedding ceremony. And all the couples who decided to get engaged would stand before God and their friends with a real pastor, and they had to say whether or not they were really going to go through it or not. Now, if you were to ask me to prejudge, I'm guessing that zero couples would do that. You know how many couples actually did it? Three couples got married, and they're still married today. That's crazy to me. It just it begs the question, is love blind? It begs the question, why does anybody watch that, other than, you know, we like to watch traffic accidents? <laughs> One of the producers from the show said this. I thought this was pretty insightful. Everyone wants to be loved for who they are on the inside. We'd all agree with that. It doesn't matter where you live, what you look like, how old you are, your background, class, social structure. Everyone wants to be loved for who they are. This removed that element of knowing what someone looks like. So I, I guess I got to ask the question, is love blind? Can you really make a lasting, lifelong commitment to somebody when you don't even know what they look like or you don't know what social class they come from? I, don't know, I might be curious to hear what you think. I'd love to talk to you about it later. The British author G.K. Chesterton says that love is actually the opposite of blind. I like what he says. He says true love is in spite of what you know about someone. True love actually depends on commitment. It's loving someone that you've made a promise to to be to, together no matter what. In fact, he says, ironically, the more you love someone truly, you're loving them in spite of who they are. You know so much, and yet you choose to willingly commit to them anyway. So we're talking about commitment today and the role that it plays in any healthy relationship. And this is something where I think a lot of people struggle. And that's the idea of committing to someone and making that commitment last. I'm sorry about the popping there. So um, when we talk about the, the role of commitment in a relationship. We've actually been in this series talking about five elements that come together to form a really healthy, strong relationship. Dr. John Van Epp wrote a great book called Becoming Better Together. He's a psychologist and a counselor, a Christian, and he just took a deep dive into all the scientific literature to try to identify elements like these that come together to make people happy and stick it out and put it together in what he calls the relationship attachment model. And we've been talking through these because these are so important, not only to a romantic relationship or a marriage, they just matter for any relationship, friendships and work relationships. And we talked about how these are like sliders on an EQ, on a radio, and the goal is to raise them all. And not only to raise them in whatever relationship you're in, but to maintain them at a high level because they fade over time. No relationship will run itself. It just takes constant attention. So the goal is to raise these. You, you know, like you ever driven up next to a car and the car next to you is just thumping? <laughs> You're like, I want to put my car on the same, the radio on the same station, that guy, because they spent a lot more money on his stereo than I did. And this is what you want in your relationships. You want to raise all of these. These are also sequential. What we found out is you don't want to get these out of order. You certainly don't want to trust and rely somebody far beyond what you know about them. That's a recipe for getting burned. It's a relational mess that's avoiding, that's in, it's avoidable. Another thing that we do culturally a lot, and we've talked about this, you know this, we go, we go real high touch real quick with real low commitment. And you do that a few times, and that sets you up for feeling sad and feeling used. And maybe like even a piece of your soul leaves with every relationship because it just never goes the way that God intended to. So and we're not judging each other. We're just saying, let's from this point forward, look at what the wisdom of God is on relationships, and let's see if we can do better. And so I know that when, in my experience, God just wants the best for all of us. He loves us so much. He cares about you. And if the Bible is correct that God is the one who made all of us and he made the relationships that we're in, it just stands to reason that he would know how they're going to work best. He's the owner. He's the creator. So we ought to be reading his instruction manual about how to do this better. So we've been looking in Philippians. You've got it pulled up. 
The key verse for this series has been Philippians 2, 5. And uh, these are the words of the Apostle Paul. He was a Christian teacher and church planter and leader. And he wrote this letter to several of his friends in a church that he'd helped start, baptize some of these people. And he told them and he encouraged them, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, I want to invite you here. If you're watching this online, do this as well. Well, I want to read, we read this together. Just read it out loud. Say it with me. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Saying like, this is the gold standard. If you want to know what it looks like to have all of these in a relationship working really well, just look at what Jesus did. And you might say, well, what does that look like? If you want to see this embodied, just think about Jesus. Go ahead and scroll on down past verse 5, going down to verse 6. It says, though he was God, Jesus didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And he, when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name that's above all names, all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the gold standard for what it looks like to put another person first, to completely, while knowing everything about them, commit to them. And Jesus does that so well. What was his mindset? We're talking about Jesus, who gave up the glory of heaven, all of that, the privilege, the honor, and gave all of the popularity up to become one of us. He was rejected by the people around him. He was betrayed by his closest friends. He was misunderstood. He was taunted. He was talked to sarcastically. He was beaten. He was arrested. He was executed under false charges. He gave up everything in order to put you and I first. So when we look at what it means to have this kind of a committed mindset, we're looking at Jesus. And we ask, what did he do for us? How can we emulate that in our own relationships? When I say Jesus committed to you, you look, where did the extent of his love take him? To die for us. And that's literally and figuratively what he calls on us to do. To die to ourselves and to put the other person first. Now, and remember this, this key verse was, in your relationships, uh, have this same mindset as Jesus now, I'm not talking about a dysfunctional, I don't matter, I'm a doormat, just do whatever you want, just take advantage of me. I'm not talking about something like codependency. I'm talking about an intentional choice where you say, I'm going to take care of myself, but I'm also going to take care of you. And I'm going to sometimes put aside what's in my best interest because I'm going to do what's in your best interest. I'm going to commit to you. That's the Jesus mindset. And that's what God has in mind for us. You know, I'm not a, as I talk about this stuff, it'd be easy to go like, well, Brian's talking down to us again. I'm not a relational expert. I've told you many times before, I'm still figuring this out. I am a student as well as a pastor and teacher. Uh, one analogy in my head that makes sense to me is like, if life is a race and we all lined up at the starting line, I was like a mile back picking dandelions when it started. And I heard the starting gun go off and went, oh, and so I had like a mile just to catch up to you all. I feel like my whole life I'm figuring things out. It's probably why God gave me this job so I can teach myself <laughs> as I teach you. At the same time, I'm not trying to undercut myself either. I am really old. So I've had lots of relationships in my life. I've had some friends who've been stuck with me for almost a half a century now. And um, we've managed to get two kids to adulthood. And they're most of the time willing to be seen with us. So we count that as a win. I've been with you guys for 21 years now. We just celebrated that anniversary, and you guys have put up with me this long. So I, we've got some neighbors. They're longtime neighbors. I've worked with some really talented, gifted people, and I get to still. So I've learned some things by making mistakes. I've learned some things by just learning to do life with you all. And this stuff just really resonates with me that makes sense that it really does come down to commitment. In fact, I would say it this way. Commitment's the secret sauce to making relationships work. I like what Dr. James Van Epp says, commitment's the glue that holds a relationship together when the other four components of a successful marriage or relationship are te temporarily lacking. Sometimes commitment's all you got when things are getting rough. I know my wife and I have found these things to be true too. We've been married 28 years now. We've known each other like 30 years. When we first started dating, there was a time for like several months where we had to be apart. We lived in different cities. So this was pre-FaceTime. We had to write letters to each other, no email, 
So every day, one of the highlights of my day was to go to the mailbox to see if I had a letter or a card from Kirsten. I hope that was the same for you. She says yes, so we would. We, and there was no, like, um, you know, no, no cell phones, so we're calling each other long distance. But you know what this did for us? I think it's one of the keys to lay a really good foundation for our relationship to, to go so well and so long. We got to know each other really well because there was nothing else to do but to talk to each other. We came to trust each other. We came to rely on each other. And then there was that day many years ago when we stood in front of God and our friends and our family, and we dressed up really nice, and we said, till death do us part. You know, and for 28 years now, I can't keep her hands off me. It's just been, <laughs> I'm going to pay for that later. Um, it's, this is what you do. This is, it really comes down to making that commitment in your marriage for sure. And if you're in a serious romantic relationship, or if you're just thinking at some point someday you would like to be, this is really where everything hinges. It comes down to commitment. You don't want to commit beyond what you know about somebody or what you trust in your life, but eventually there comes a point where you have to just say, I'm all in, and I'm going to build this up. I'm going to go the distance. So I want to get real practical with you. What do you do to build commitment? And I, I say this knowing that culturally we don't have a whole lot of touch points to work off of. Sad to say, but it is what it is, so let's just figure this out. Uh, I would encourage you, first of all, it sounds so simple, but this is really key. Commit to love. There's a music group I listen to. I like rock music, and I don't know if you've heard of The Darkness. And they have this song This describes like the beginning of a relationship, and the guy is singing about how I was, he was just blown away by this person he'd met. And there was just these wonderful feelings, and everything around them just seemed to point to this is the one. But then it gets to the chorus, and he starts singing, but love is only a feeling drifting away. When I'm in your arms, I can start believing it's here to stay, but love is only a feeling anyway. And what he's saying is, I know that these butterflies in my stomach and the feelings I have and the thoughts that I, I just can't stop thinking about this person, that, he says that's going to go away, and when that goes away, the love goes away. And that's culturally where we're at. We just think of love that way. And I like the song because it's really well written. It's got a great melody, great musicianship, but I, my head can't turn off the fact that I don't agree with that. So I'm always in my head thinking love is more than a feeling drifting away. Biblically speaking, that's the case. When we're talking about love in the Bible sense, in the Jesus, the one who came from heaven to earth to be with us and, and to die for us, love is so much more than a feeling that's here today, gone tomorrow. It's, it's more than that. It's a choice that you make. What we've done is we've often conflated love and feelings. We've made the two the same thing, and they're not at all. And we know this, too. There's another part of your brain that knows that. There's a study that was done, and they brought people in, and they invited them to write down all the synonyms they could think of for love, just write them down. Then they walked over, and then they said, I want you to write down all the synonyms you can think of for commitment. And you know what? The, the lists were the same. Three-quarters of the words on each list were exactly the same. There's a part of us that just knows love and commitment go hand in hand. In many ways, they're the same thing. Because love isn't a feeling, it's a choice that you make. It's a decision to put the other person ahead of yourself. It's a, a mindset that says, I'm going to exercise my will and stay committed to you, no matter what's going on, no matter what you do, whatever it costs me, we're in it for the long haul. You go back to Philippians here, you go back to verse 3 and verse 4, and we see what that looks like. He says, you know, don't be selfish, don't try to impress other people, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Now, if you start to think, well, that doesn't sound right, just listen to verse 4. Don't only look out for your own interests. Take care of yourself, but also look out, have an interest in others, too. It's, it's a both and. There are moments where you say, I know what is in my best interest, but because of love, because of what I know you need, I'm going to put you first. Because I've made a commitment that I'm putting you first, I'm going to live this out in my life. And I want to say this. I don't know who first said this, but it really resonated with me. Mature people live by their commitments, not by their feelings. In those moments where you just don't feel like you love them anymore, love doesn't really have a say if you go by your feelings. But if you go by the commitments you've made to people, love's still in the room. You know, love isn't brain chemicals and butterflies in your stomach and if we feel it or not. Love is for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. You know, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to bail. I'm not going to ditch you. I'm not going to find something better. 
I'm in for the long haul. And when you go into a marriage relationship with an understanding like that, it changes things. Now, I'm not saying here, and I, I need to be real clear, it's not to say that you won't have some doubts. I don't know if you've ever thought of divorce if you're a married person. If you thought, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. If you're online, I don't expect you to write this in on your Connect card or anything. But if you've thought of divorce, you're not alone. There's a study that was done that said out of all married couples, 70% of married spouses thought of divorce at least a couple few times in the last year. I don't know if this was done in 2020. It would probably explain a lot with all the things we went through last year with the pandemic. But it's sometimes it's just normal to just a thought occur. You're like, can I do this anymore? It doesn't necessarily mean you're headed for divorce just because you think that way. Uh, and, and what it really maybe says more is we are in a culture that is very uh, lack of commitment forward. Divorce is just in our social circles. It's what we see on media. It's what we see on TV. And so it's in our minds. It's not necessarily that's exactly what you're hap is going to happen to you. There's another study that was done. I found this so fascinating. If you think that divorce is your only alternative and that it's going to make things better, you need to understand there was a study that was done with uh, over thousands of couples over five years. They really wanted to see the impact over a long period of time with different people. And there were people in this study who did go ahead and they were very unhappy in their marriage and they got a divorce. And their outcome was the same as people who didn't in many cases. They were just as unhappy after the divorce. The rates of depression were just as high after the divorce as, as they were before. And so what I'm saying here is there are times when maybe divorce is the only alternative. I understand that. Scripturally, there are some places where this is certainly the case, but it doesn't necessarily fix things always either. Here's what fascinated me by this study. As I said, they t walked with these people over five years, and they took the people who on day one said, our marriage is just very unhappy. And they stayed with them for five years. And the researchers were surprised by this. 65% of the people on day one who said they, their marriage was awful, on day five said, or year five said, our marriage is great. In fact, the people who rated their marriage the worst on year five were saying their marriage was one of the best. Guess what I'm just saying to you is, if you feel like it's not going to get better, think again. You may be on the verge of taking a relationship that just feels miserable, and it's going to become wonderful. You may be on the edge of going from unhappy to happy, and the thing that got you through it was you honored your commitment to one another and stuck it out. You just don't know what God could do in the interim there. And statistically speaking, it's going to work out if you'll give it a chance to, and you'll work at it. And again, I need to give a caveat. I am not talking here about staying in an abusive relationship. Uh, Jesus was very clear. He gave a reason. He said, sometimes... Your spouse is just such an idiot that it is, he's so hard-hearted that divorce is the only option. They're just being unfaithful to you. Paul said if your spouse abandons you. It's, it's just two reasons among others that sometimes divorce because of a broken world, as God says, and it's not going to be good for you, but sometimes it's necessary. But in many cases, is that true? In many cases, what would happen if we would just stick it out and see what happens? I'm just curious. You know, there's some things that we sometimes think about. Is it going to work out? Sometimes commitment's all you got. But sometimes commitment's all you need. I want to suggest something else to you that you commit yourself to, not just love. I want you to commit yourself to faithfulness. I love this verse from the Bible. It talks about God himself. This is out of Psalm 89. Listen to this. I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is enduring as the heavens. Down in verse 8. O Lord, God of heaven's armies, where is there anyone as mighty as you, O Lord? You are entirely faithful. I love this image of God. God can be trusted. You can turn to him, and you don't ever have to worry about him changing his mind or becoming different or finding something out about God that you didn't know that now changes everything. He's good. Wouldn't it be great if everybody was like God, that everybody could be counted on? Wouldn't it be great if you and I were as faithful as God was? You ever, like, have that sense of, man, I just wish I had done better in my life with some things? If you feel that way about the other people or even about yourself, this is nothing new. 3,000 years ago, one of the wisest people who ever lived, King Solomon, wrote about this. And this is in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6. He said, many will say that they're loyal friends, but who can find someone who's truly reliable? Uh, it sounds to me like the words of a guy maybe who's been burned a few times relationally. 
Maybe he's been the one who's burned a few people as well. And he's describing faithfulness. Doesn't it sting to be on the receiving end of somebody's unfaithfulness? Doesn't it kind of eat away at your conscience when you know that you could have been a little bit more faithful to someone or in a situation? Look, I know this uh, probably sounds old-fashioned to some of you. Be like, Brian, you're like, this is Little House on the Prairie stuff. <laughs> what are you doing here? Maybe we need a little more old-fashioned. Maybe we ought to look around our culture and go, if this was working so good, then maybe we wouldn't be so unhappy. I think faithfulness is something that we should be aspiring to and working towards. Let me give you an example of what this might look like in a marriage. This is uh, about Chris and Yvette. They'd been married a few years when Chris got called up to active duty. He was going to deploy to Iraq and uh, knew that he was going to be leaving his wife through some pretty significant milestones of their marriage. They had kids. So what he did was, this was really cool. Chris called the florist and arranged for flowers to be delivered on their anniversary, on the first day of school for their kids, for the holidays he was going to be gone, paid for it in advance. And he knew his wife was going to be hosting some things like a birthday party at the house, so he paid a cleaning service to come in before and after all the holidays and all the birthday parties. Did the same thing for car repair, lawn care, just whatever he could do to prearrange, he did that. And then he took it the next step. Guys, I hope you're taking notes. He is batting a thousand here. Uh, he wrote some notes to his wife and to his kids describing how much he missed them. He knew he was going to be halfway around the world, but they were still in his heart and they were still together. What was he doing? He was using his will. He was using his resources to say very clearly, I'm still in this. I'm with you. We may be apart right now, but I'm in this for the long haul and you can count on me. That's what love looks like. And that's what faithfulness looks like. Dude, Chris set the bar pretty high there, but we can do that. It's in your wheelhouse to think of ways that you can express your love, commitment, and devotion. And again, I know it's old fashioned, but I got one more thing to say. You know, you commit to love and you commit to faithfulness. I think you should commit publicly. And I'm speaking to people here. If you think at some point in your life you'd like to get married or you're in a serious, serious relationship, I know culturally speaking right now, marriage is not real high on anybody's list. The younger you are, the less likely you are to, to go ahead and get married. I talked to a lot of my friends who are younger and they said, like, I don't need a piece of paper to say that I'm committed to this person. A lot of people have just seen other people go through relational distress and divorce and they're like, I just don't want that for myself. So we'll stay together for the rest of our lives, but we're not gonna just do the whole marriage thing. And I get that. And again, I would ask you to rethink that. There is something about standing in front of God and all of your family and friends and saying, till death do us part, that just really seals it to say, you can count on me to know in the deepest part of who you are that I'm there for you. There's just something about that commitment. And I know here's what we do culturally a lot. Again, we, we raise the, the touch level and without the commitment there. I would invite you to just, again, go back to say, what does God say? And from this point forward, just trust his way as being the best way. I mean, there's a conventional wisdom from the world about how you can be happy. And then there's God's way. And I'm always going to point you towards this. This is what we do here at Connection. We're here to make disciples of Jesus and mentor you in his way. This is what it looks like. He's the one who came from heaven and committed to you. And he teaches you how to be committed to the people around you. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know where you are in your relationships, your friendships. I don't know if maybe you feel like you've kind of dropped the ball on commitment. I want you to know that from today forward, it can be different. And there's so much grace and love and mercy from God. And he'll teach you all that you need to know. And I know that sometimes as I talk to people, and maybe you're watching online and you feel this way too, that you feel like the one who let you down was God. And, and I say that God's committed to you, but you don't feel it. You feel like God let you down. He wasn't there for you when you needed him the most. And I want you to know that that may be how you feel, but that is certainly not true. There has never been a moment when God was not available and ready to be right there with you. In fact, the deepest, worst times you've gone through in your life, he still loved you very much and was there with you, whether you knew it or not. So I have no qualms about asking you today to commit your life to Jesus completely. This is what we talk about when we say that you become a Christian. You say, Jesus is my Lord. He's my leader. You ask him to forgive you of your sins, to save you. He already did the work. He died on the cross to buy you freedom and eternal life. And it's up to you to simply say yes to that. 
to go public with your commitment to say Jesus is Lord in front of a group like this, a group of people who love you and are ready to celebrate with you, to go into the water right over here in the baptistry and to be immersed in baptism in Jesus Christ and say, from this point forward, I belong to him. I'm a follower of Jesus and completely committed to him, knowing that he's already committed to you. We want to help you do that today. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, let's help each other take that next step. Let me pray for you. Father, I'm so thankful that you committed to us before we even knew you, before we even uh, thought about you. You had already decided that you love us, and that's never going to change. We know that you are faithful. We know you are reliable. We know that you have so much grace and mercy. We ask you to just open our hearts to receive that, that your Holy Spirit would help us see the areas that we have been hurting ourselves and hurting other people. We're sorry for that, and we ask you to help us change and grow, and we know that you will. I pray for you to bring just commitment in this church body so we are completely devoted to one another in love. And I ask for you, Father, to help us to do all the things that we could not do on our own. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What a a wonderful challenge Brian gave to us as it leads us right into communion where we are remembering our commitment to him. I love knowing that Jesus has already committed to us. And in, the, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter says this. He says, Jesus, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. And it's by his wounds you are healed. Jesus committed to us everything. And so, and all he asks of us is to just commit back to him and accept that gift of grace, accept his sacrifice. And so whenever we are taking communion now, we are remembering that choice that we made to commit to him. We're remembering whether it was a few days ago, whether it was decades ago, that decision we made to commit to him, to remember his sacrifice for us and live for him. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the sacrifice of your son. Uh, I I thank you that, that you have committed to us, that you have... You've given up your son for us and that he went through with it, that he saw all that we have done, that he knew that we were not going to be perfect, and yet he still died for us. I pray that during this time we can remember uh, that, we can remember the sacrifice, and we can remember our choice that we made to commit to him. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. There's communion stations in the back sides in front of the room. You can go take that whenever you're ready. And as Brian said, if you have not committed to Jesus yet, we want to be here to help you do that. We want to, we have a baptistry ready to go. We have a, a place for you to commit, uh, commit to following him with your life. Uh, if you want to continue this conversation, I've been saying it every week, but I encourage you to go to our website, connectionchristian.org, and on our resources, you see some life group videos. Whether you are in a life group or not, you can still go down this conversation of committing what committing to Jesus, committing to God does look like in your life. And I just want to also let you know, 
connection is a place where we want you to, uh, to obey God by, by offering, by giving, and by doing the sacrifice of giving some of your money uh, to, that God has blessed you with. And so you can give online. You can give by going to the office. We have offering boxes on your way out that you can uh, drop your money in there as a way for us to fulfill our mission, to connect people to God and each other through Jesus. One other way that you can do that, one other way that you can help our church and you can help with your money is we're going to be doing at the end of the month, we're going to be doing a fundraiser for our teenagers. The Ignite Student Ministry is putting on a trivia night, and the, the money we raise from this is actually going to go help pay for their camps where they will be able to be make and mentor and mobilize at camps. We have some middle schoolers. We have seven of our middle schoolers that are going to be going to a High Hill Christian camp in High Hill, Missouri in June. We're going to bring, a, you know, 12 to 15 more high schoolers to Springfield for a camp called Mission Love Out Loud, where we're going to go into the streets of Springfield. We're going to serve. We're going to serve at food banks. We're going to serve in nursing homes if we can get in there. We're going to serve in homeless shelters and share the light of Christ there, make mentor and mobilize there, and then come home and do the same thing. So if you are wanting to help support the next generation, I want to encourage you to put March, May 28th on your calendars and get a table together for our trivia night so we can help support them. If you're newer here, we got these welcome home cards, and these are a chance for you to, to commit to say you want to be a part of this church or say that you want to learn more about this church even. And we actually have someone, a couple here that has committed to doing that, and so I'm invite them to stand back. They're back in the back of the room now, I believe. You guys want to stand up so we can show your commitment back there? Brian, are they back there today? There they are over here. We got them. So this is a new family. This is, oh. And so I want to, I'm going to actually ask you right now the a question we already know the answer to. You've already done that as you committed to Jesus. We're going to have you commit to this church. Do you believe in Jesus? He died for your sins, that he rose from the dead? I see that fist pounding there. That's excitement right there. Awesome. Well, welcome home. Welcome to Connection. I want to invite everyone to stand up right now. We're going to close with our benediction. It's from 1 Thessalonians 3.12, and we're all going to say this together as this is our anthem for the week as we go out from here. Let's say this together. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. Have a wonderful and blessed week. We'll see you later.